Okay, today is July the 2nd, 2020. We're glad that you joined us, and we are going to prepare ourselves in our usual fashion by having a few moments of silent prayer and rebound if necessary. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for another opportunity to be here to feed upon your word. We are preparing for whatever is next. And the main thing is that we trust you and that we apply the doctrine that we learn. It's filed away in our brain. We just need the volition to trigger it, to bring it into our soul, which the Holy Spirit does bring it into our consciousness so that we can use it. But first we have to make sure that we keep adding to that inventory which we plan to do this evening. So we pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to continue where we did last time. I think this is our third session in the part of a series I did, I think it was in 2006, four, and it's Deception or Doctrine, and this is focusing on slavery, and I thought with the introduction of Romans, we had talked a little bit about slavery in Rome, in the ancient Rome, and there's a lot being said about slavery today, so I thought this would be a good time for us to bone up on this very challenging for some uh, issue. I think this session might be the most important, maybe the most relevant, so we will get into it. Ah, it's working, good. Okay, this is lesson number five, and we have been going through Judge Sewell's, there's jo Judge Sewell, and the other judge is Judge Saffin, and they are on opposite sides of the slavery issue, and they both were working out of the same court, and this is a back and forth that went on back in um, 1701, a long time ago, uh, but it's as current as today as far as its importance. Now, this portion, we're on objection number four. We have already covered the first three. And what is presented here is an objection to Judge Sewell's viewpoint or his answer. So first of all, what you see in red is the objection to Judge Sewell's answer or his position. And it is, it, we're going to state his re reply to it. And then we'll look at Judge Saffin, which is the only other side of the coin, another judge who will make a comment as well. This is our last objection. The objection is that Abraham acquired slaves without contracting any guilt. And so Judge Sewell thinks that owning slaves, having anything to do with slaves, is a sin and that it's wrong. And so he's going to answer this, and here is his answer. He said, until the circumstances of Abraham's purchase was recorded, no argument can be drawn from it. And he gives Leviticus chapter 25, verse 46, is quoted to demonstrate that it was strictly forbidden for Israelites to buy and sell one another for slaves. Furthermore, we are to love our neighbor and apply the golden rule of Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. That is his reply. I think it's pretty weak. But we'll see what Judge Saffin here his reply, what he had to say about that. He says, if we knew the circumstances of Abraham's purchase to be lawful and good, then we must conclude from your argument that it would be legal and right to buy and own slaves. Leviticus 25.46 has no bearing on the buying and selling of infidels from a heathen country. So just because, and it is true that if you were living back in that day, you could not buy or sell an, a brother Israelite. You just couldn't do it. And he, he quoted that as being one of the reasons uh, why the 
Objection, Abraham acquired slaves without contracting any guilt. That doesn't have anything to do with Leviticus 25, 46, which is uh, the prohibition of selling Israelites to another Israelite. In other words, you can't buy or sell your fellow brethren. And that's what he's pointing out here. He says Leviticus 25, 46 has no bearing on buying and selling of infidels from a heathen country. And then he says, moreover, being good and respectful to others, which is what we see in Matthew 7, 12. Being good and respectful to others does not mean that we are to love and respect all men alike. I may love my servant well, but my son better. I may see a neighbor in need, but that does not mean that I must also give him much of my estate in order to make him equal with me. A slave owner obeyed, Matthew 7, 1 and 2, by treating his slave in a fair and respectful manner. And that is true. We've gone over the regulations, and that's one of them, that the, those, the Israelites were forbidden to mistreat or treat in an unfair way their slaves. But Saul isn't, he doesn't consider that. He's just saying you're not supposed to own one anyway. And so they're in two different places. Now, what I'm going to give you here is what I've been working on for the last two days, or more today, but yesterday as well. That little asterisk there is telling me that this is not where a part of the uh, series that I did back then. I added these now because I thought they would be very instructive and helpful in the time in which we live. So, there were several reasons why the Civil War occurred. I don't know about you, but yes, uh, yesterday uh, there's this, sh this program called um, so Overtime Outnumbered or something like that. It's a, it's a news program. And the lady that was asking the questions started out by saying that we have a problem because these, these monuments and statues are coming down of Confederate generals. And she says, but we have to remember that they fought that war in, in order to preserve slavery. I've heard that over and over and over again, that the South had nothing to go to war with uh, because of other than slavery. And that simply is not true. And I'm going to address that right now, and as well as secession and a few other things. So there were several reasons why the Civil War occurred. Conflicting economic, economic interests. That was probably the biggest one. Cultural differences. Religious disparity. Disputes over slavery, but the main reason centered on states' rights. You see what was happening now? I'm not reading now, I'm just commenting. The North was going ever closer to a centralized government. They saw the European model was more like that, and they thought that this would... Uh, be better for them. In other words, giving more power to a federal government. And the South was not buying it. They didn't, they didn't want to do that at all. And so the more things that were happening where they saw their rights evaporating, which we know exactly what that's like, they finally decided they could take it no more. And But the economic one was probably the coup de grace. But there's a, all these factors we're pushing them towards this hellistic war where 600,000 Americans died. So I have a few subpoints under here. Well, I, I just kind of gave it, gave that to you uh, just then. Northern folks were partial to centralizing power in the federal government, but the southern folk wanted to keep the states sovereign. The South and some in the North believed the states had the right to secede and nullify federal laws they considered to be unconstitutional. That's not a Johnny-come-lately thing. This happened right 
uh, even in the 1700s and on into the 1800s. So there's several reasons. Now, B is most people think, most people these days think that the Civil War was solely about slavery. I haven't met anybody that, on TV anyway, I hadn't met him, but I hadn't heard anybody say that it wasn't about slavery. I think they're afraid to. It was, slavery was an issue, but it wasn't even hardly in the top issues. This is what they think. The North fought to end slavery and the South fought to keep it. And that simply is not true. Here's a few things to consider. This is a quote by Charles Dickens. He said, quote, The northern onslaught upon slavery was no more than a piece of specious humbug designed to conceal its desire for economic control of the southern states. This is from Jefferson Davis. The truth remains intact and incontrovertible that the existence of African servitude was in no wise the cause of the conflict. To whatever extent the question of slavery may have served, it was far more from being, it was far from being the cause, cause the cause of the, the war. You see, what's, people, what they do is they take their norms, their standards, their beliefs, the things that they think about slavery in this day, and they try to export it back there and think everybody thought that slavery was horrendous and that it had to be stomped out at all costs. Slavery was just the opposite of that. It was everyday ho-hum, part of their culture, part of the everyday living that they had, and... The main thing that stirred it up was that new states coming in, there was a battle over whether they were going to be free or slave states. But there's so much information that um, is, is exhaustive amount to explain what the culture was like that, but nobody pays any attention to it. What I just gave you is what I heard and have heard from people and pundits and news anchors, and everybody you can think of. People these days think the Civil War was about slavery, solely about slavery. The North fought to end slavery, and which is not true, and the South fought to keep it. And that was not true. Either, neither one of them were true, as we'll see as we go through this. Oh, here, here's, here's another thing here. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's intention was to preserve the Union, not to free the slaves. This is, um, uh, he said, and this is a quote, I didn't put it in quotation marks, I should have. This is a quote from Abraham Lincoln. He said, my paramount object is this struggle is to save the Union, and it is not either to save or destroy slavery, end quote. That was by Lincoln. Point C. One of the most onerous controversies centered on the enactment of federal tariff laws of 1828 and 1832. Have anybody here ever heard about these onerous tariff laws? I see a, well, yeah, I see a few heads, but most people have no idea that that had any part to play, and it was probably the major reason, in my opinion anyway, that they went to war. The South comprised less than one-fifth of the nation's population, yet it paid approximately 83% of the tariff revenue. Now just let that sink in for a moment. 20% of the population was paying 83% of the tariffs. During 1860, the imports of the South were valued at $331 million. Those of the North were $31 million. So the federal laws caused the South to carry a tax burden that was 10 times heavier than the North. Those abominable tariffs were possibly the last straw that motivated the South to secede. But the North had grown accustomed to this unfair advantage, advantage and feared that if the South seceded, they would no longer uh, pay the tariffs which the North had become had come to rely on, so their economy would be devastated. 
But the South couldn't survive if they continued to pay such unreasonable tariffs. Can you see the clash right there? The, the North was making a killing off these tariffs. And the South just couldn't continue. They were just uh, being obliterated. But th there's so many other details I could give you, but I've got a lot to, to tell you here. But this, there was a debate whether even if the South seceded, that the North would still go and block their ports unless they would pay these tariffs. Uh, it, there's a lot of ongoing stories like this that are, are very uh, important to the reasons that they went to war. But it was e economically, it was unbelievable hard for the South to make it under those conditions. Okay, here's another question. Do states have the right to secede? I would guess if you went and you talked to most people today, what kind of answer would you get? Would you get a yes or no question, uh, answer? Yeah. No. Of course not. Well, that's what you would expect, expect from people who don't know history, don't know the Bible, and just listen to the boob tube. Number one, under do states have the right to secede? The southern states seceded from the Union in the same manner that they had acceded to the Union, which was by the action of a convention of the people of those states. It's not just like they got a mob together and going to leave. It was organized. It was the people getting together and deciding whether they were going to secede or whether they were not. Now, I'll give us a red star by this one. I'm very stingy with my red stars. The right to alter or abolish the form of government they lived under was never surrendered by the people of the states that acceded to the new union. To accede is to join it. To secede is to uh, leave it. So they had the right to alter or abolish that form of government. That sounds familiar. Where might that be found? Declaration of Independence, which is one of my things here. I've got some sub-points under this. A, the Articles Confederation from 1781 to 1789, that was our first constitution. And it lasted four years. Buchanan was the uh, president then. And the Articles of Confederation acknowledged the state's sovereignty and recognized their right to remain or not remain in the Union. Of course, that was set aside when the convention in Philadelphia met. And I could tell you a whole lot about that. Um, they, were, they were there to amend the Articles of Confederation, not to create a new constitution. And all the states weren't represented there. It, they didn't have a quorum. But anyway, that's beside the point. The point I'm making is the Articles of Confederation acknowledged that they had the right to remain or not remain in the Union. Point B, the right of the states to secede was understood by all. New York, Rhode Island, and Virginia included it as a condition of ratifying the Constitution. They didn't need to because it was understood that the states could leave the Union because they voluntarily joined the Union and they should be able to voluntarily leave if they were not pleased. That's what freedom is about. But these three states thought it was so important that it is part of their ratifying uh, the Constitution. They had to write whether they were going to ratify it or not, and in it they included the right to secede. Point C. The Constitution neither forbids states to secede nor author authorizes the federal government to prevent, to prevent their secession. That's a very important point. You can't go to the Constitution, which is the what highest law of the land, whenever the laws are in pursuant thereof, and so the Constitution does not forbid secession, nor authorizes the federal government to prevent secession. So forget about the Constitution as being any 
source that would you could rely on to say that you, secession is not allowed. Point E. This is a well. I'm not going to say who it is, but you see it who, where it is anyway. Here's a quote: Any people anywhere being inclined and having the power have the right to rise up and shake off existing government and form a new one that suits them better. This is a most valuable, sacred right. Who said that? Abraham Lincoln. Thirteen years later, when the southern states, southern states wanted to secede, he called it treason. But that is a quote. The terms revolution, rebellion, and rebels should not be associated with the southern states that seceded from the union of sovereign states known as the United States of America. They had as much right to dissolve the political band that connected them to a tyrannical government as their ancestors did in 1776. What happened in 1776? Well, that's, they call it, so many of the terms are not even right. They call it the American Revolution. It was not a revolution. They were not trying to overthrow Great Britain. What they did was secede. They just said, no more. We're not going to, we're not going to be abused anymore. And so, does anybody question the right of the colonists to secede? to withdraw from the a nation that they were part of? Have you ever heard anybody say, oh, they can't do that? Well, it's exactly what the South did. The Declaration of Independence says it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government. And it also states that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, which is referring to the right of li life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, or I would say also property, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government. If that applied to the first war of independence, which is wrongly called the American Revolution, why isn't to, why isn't it applied to the second? But when the South decided to, say, to leave the North, and create a new government, a new nation. There's one major difference between the secessionists of 1776 and 1861. The Confederacy session of 1861 formed a government that categorically denied any additional impute, uh, importation of American slaves into the new nation being formed whereas the founders' secession continued to allow it. Do you understand what that's saying? Most people don't know that the Southern, in the uh, Confederate States of America, in their constitution, it forbid any importation of slaves into the country. Point number four. As long as the people retain the right to alter or abolish their government, they remain free. When that right is withdrawn, they are no longer free. When Abraham Lincoln demanded the troops, the use of troops to enforce the, in quotation marks, rights of the federal government, he in effect destroyed the very foundation of American civil liberties, governed by the consent of the govern, governed, that's what we have, or you did have. It changed to, from con conquest has replaced consent as the foundation of American government. Do you understand that? And it started when Lincoln took troops and invaded the South. They did not consent to the government anymore, so they left, and they were attacked by the North. The U.S. Supreme Court in 1869, in the case of Texas versus White, declared secession unconstitutional. What might you say that decision was? Could it not be null and void? Where did they, where did they come up with that opinion? 
It's not in the Constitution. Where else would they go? Out of thin air. Just like the last, I don't know, I think they passed one out of six, the last six. One of them, I think, was probably constitutional and right, but the last five have been abominable. I'm talking about this. In 1869, there was a Supreme Court case called Texas versus White. And it declared secession unconstitutional. So if, what would you do if somebody said, oh, well, now wait a minute. The Supreme Court made a decision saying that, the, that secession is unconstitutional. Okay, based on what? That's what I want to know. You, if you took and looked at all the decisions of the Supreme Court over the years, you would wonder why we have one. So what I'm saying, if anybody brought that up, is that pursuant to the Constitution that this, that, no, there's nothing about that in there, in the Constitution. The Constitution does not condone nor uh, what's the other opposite of condoning um, protecting uh, the secession and if it's not there then how can somebody claim to use it it just doesn't deal with it it certainly doesn't say that the federal government has any authority to move against those who decide to secede it just isn't there so where else did these justices go to get that opinion? How about thin air? Whoop! Political, they were, this was a political decision. Okay, quote from Andrew, how do you pronounce that, Lytle? Lytle, maybe? The Virginia Quarterly Review, 1931, this came out. Quote, if Lincoln loved the Union, he was responsible more than any man for its destruction, for he con consciously violated the Constitution. The war was not a war of slavery versus freedom. It was a war between those who preferred a federal nation to those who preferred a confederation of sovereign states. Slavery was the ink thrown into the pool to confuse the issue. Now, what is a federation... Uh, a federated nation and a confederation of sovereign states. Point, point six tells us. A confederation is, in political terminology, is a union of sovereign states, each of which is free to act independently. That's the way our country was founded. We call them states, and we think these are subcategories of the federal government. States are nations within themselves. Sovereign nations that group together to form a federal government to protect themselves and do a few deals. Outside of that, they re regained their, so I mean, they uh, had their sovereignty. It is distinguished from a federation in which the individual states are subordinate to the central government. Which one do we have today? I, I'm, I'm just asking if you, your opinion, you don't have to, you don't have to say anything, I'm just wanting you to ask yourself. New England Confederation in 1643, the New England Confederation formed in 1643 and lasting for more than 40 years is the earliest example of confederation in America. During the American War for Independence, a.k.a. the Revolutionary War, which is a misnomer. The former colonies set up a confederation and stated its purpose in the Articles of the Confederation, uh, in the Articles of Confederation, and it was a confederation. Point number seven. President James Buchanan, in the last days of his administration from 1857 to 1861, he was the president right before Lincoln came in, declared that the federal government would not forcibly prevent any secessions. 
However, Lincoln, in his inaugural address on March 4, 1861, rejected the right of secession. Point eight. Before Abraham Lincoln became president, he acknowledged that slavery within any state was legal and that the rights to property of the slave owners would be respected. A clash developed over whether slavery would be allowed in the new states entering the Union. That was a big deal. I said that earlier. His position was that the federal government had the authority to decide the issue, whereas the leaders of the South saw that the people of the states as the one who should make the decision. Okay. The, all those things is what are the things that I added. I'm just trying to bring you up to speed, give you a little bit of history so that you will recognize uh, most of what you hear is complete and utter balderdash. It's nonsense. I, was, I read again before I came the um, proclamation the, uh, ex the, that Lincoln made, the, what's the... Um, Emancipation Proclamation. I actually read it again. And, of course, they're saying this, he freed the slaves. And they would go to that document. Obviously, they've never read it. He didn't free any slaves. There were slaves in the north, in northern states, that he could have freed because he had jurisdiction there. But he didn't free those. One... one um, source I read said that he didn't have the authority to, to free him in the north. I have a hard time believing that when, when I know all the other things that he did that he didn't have the power to do, but he did it anyway. But in any case, he certainly did not have the authority or the jurisdiction in another country to free, to free slaves. And yet, I saw that there were two Republican senators who just yesterday or the day before uh, are trying to make it uh, uh, Juneteenth to be a federal uh, national holiday. And Juneteenth, as you probably know, celebrates the slaves being free due to the Emancipation Proclamation, which came out in January the 1st, 1863. War was over in 1865, so there's Two years later, or two and a half years maybe, that the slaves in uh, news got to Galveston, and from Galveston, it came into Texas saying that free that the slaves were free, and they that that happened on June nineteenth, and so that's why they call it Juneteenth Day. I doubt that these Congress, these excuse me, these uh, senators, Republican senators, know anything about what I just said but they're trying to do something that's politically expedient for them. But they're on the wrong side. And I hope that the people, that their constituency will hold them accountable. I hope the whole American people will hold them accountable to side with what Black Lives Matter is, dis is demanding. Shame on them. Okay, now we're changing gears a bit. Are you ready to change gears? This is self-explanatory. In Cincinnati, Ohio in 1845, that was before the War of Northern Aggression began. You know, I could say the Civil War, but I, I just I don't want to bring myself to say something that's a misnomer. It was not a Civil War, and it was not the war between the states. It was a, it was a war between two nations. And the South was not attacking the, the South was not attacking the North. It wasn't a civil war like they were trying to overpower them or anything. That's why I call it, I call it different things. Sometimes I call it the Second War of Independence. Sometimes I call it the War of Northern Aggression. Sometimes I call it the Southern War of Independence. So I hope you grant me that latitude. In Cincinnati, Ohio, in 1845, two Presbyterian pastors had a debate 
that is very informative to us today, the debate over the issue, is slaveholding in itself sinful? And the relation between master and slave, a sinful relation. Now, we went through Judge Sewell and Safin in the 1700s. Now we're uh, 145 years later, and still, huge problem we have here. So, Reverend J. Blanchard took the position that it was, that it was sinful, and Dr. N. L. Rice took the position that it is not. It should be noted that this debate took place 145 years after the two judges in 1701, Judge Sewell and Judge Safin, addressed these issues in the tracts we just studied. It must be remembered that the theme of the debate was not about sinful acts that took place within the system of slavery. It was about whether slavery in itself and the relationship between slave and master is a sin. Dr. Rice maintained that American slavery ought never to have existed, but the slaveholding states did inherit that evil. They didn't go and kidnap these people to sell them. They were already slaves. So, Again, Dr. Rice said that American slavery ought never to have existed, but the slaveholding states did inherit that evil, and the important and difficult question was, how shall the evil be removed? How far were individuals required to go to restore slaves to freedom under the circumstances that existed then? Should people be bound to enrich a man who was reduced to poverty by others? Would, is that a requirement? And who would demand it? And if they did demand it, on what basis? I'm just throwing some things in that kind of is a bit illustrative there. Now, Reverend Blanchard began the debate. He's the one that said it is a sin. Reverend Blanchard began the debate with a 40-minute diatribe about the cruelties and unjust treatment of slaves from the Roman Empire era to the present. Then Dr. Rice, Rice made two important distinctions. Number one, there's a vast difference between owning slaves and the abduction of innocent people into forced servitude by slave traders. One is sinful, one is not. And by the way, that is biblically supported. Point two, one should not condemn an institution for a relationship as being sinful because there are those who abuse it. The question is not how much men can sin in relationship in a relationship, but whether rela the relationship is in itself sinful and whether a man is to be denounced as a heinous sim sinner simply because he is a master. And that's what, this is one thing that they always do when you talk about slavery. They go right to the few that did abuse their slaves. And, and they would say, because of that, uh, slavery, if you owned a slave, then you, you were a sinner. That's a, that's, not, that's a jump that the Bible does not condone. Magnifying the sins committed in this institution does not change the fact that this relation may exist and does in multitudes of instances where cruelty and oppression do not exist. Of course, anyone would condemn one person abusing another person for any reason. Consequently, the sin is not in the relationship itself. In denying that slaveholding is in itself sinful, I do not defend slavery as an institution that ought to be perpetuated. That's really important. Do you understand? Just because you, you deny that slaveholding is in itself sinful, in denying, I gotta read the whole thing. In denying that slaveholding is in itself sinful does not necessarily mean that slavery as an institution ought to be perpetuated. That's a lot of what people would think. If, if someone was, were, were listening to this tape or the others I have before it, and, and they would say, 
he's for slavery. I am categorically, I am not for slavery any more than I am for divorce. But just because the institution is not something that we would like to have, it did exist. And if the if the institution of slavery was a sin, then the Bible would tell us it's a sin. And the only component of slavery that the Bible calls sin is those who would ki kidnap others in order to sell them or to use force, force labor for themselves. And it was punishable by death. But who wants to go that far? Let's just across the board say slavery is a vicious evil. And anybody in the South were evil too. And we got to pull down their, their monuments, get rid of the Confederate flag. Even though it was the South that had a great awakening and, and a spiritual revival during that war. And these generals and these people were unbelievable in their generosity and their love and Christian duty that they performed. But none of that matters. They own slaves. Let's, let's just wipe them and let's just tar them all with the same brush. So consequently, the sin is not in the relationship itself and denying that slaveholding is in itself sinful. I do not defend slavery as an institution that ought to be perpetuated. Dr. Rice also pointed out that rehashing accounts of slave abuse will no more prove that slavery is a sin than rehashing the accounts of wife abuse proves that marriage is slavery. There are many biblical reasons for Christians to be opposed to slavery, but that is not what the debate was about. Dr. Rice freely said that he was opposed to slavery. The question is being debated, is sla slavery a sin? And you know from what we went through the first two times over this, that there are all kinds of slavery. And whenever you're talking about slavery, you have to be specific. What kind of slavery are you talking about? Indentured servants? Poor people selling their daughters as slaves so that they'd have a better chance at life? Well, what kind are you talking about? We, like Dr. Rice, must always go to the Bible for answers. The Bible cannot be legitimately used to defend slavery or to prove that slavery is a sin. Well, it can in one instance. It regulates and therefore ameliorates, meaning corrects, the evils associated with it. I must, this is very important. This is what the Bible is doing. We don't want to say that the Bible proves that slavery is not a sin. It does not. It regulates it, and it does show that in one particular part of slavery, the part that where someone goes and captures someone else forcibly and then sells them or have, have them forced labor for the rest of their lives, that is a sin punishable by execution. The rest of the type of sin, of, of, excuse me, of slavery is the Bible regulates. Now, you see I have this in yellow, but let me, let me read this one more time. I'm starting right here. I want you to be sure you get this right here. The Bible cannot be legitimately used to defend slavery or to prove that slavery is a sin. It regulates and therefore ameliorates, meaning corrects, the evil associated with it. That's what the Bible does. And then this is in yellow. God cannot associate with sin, therefore his regulations for slavery proves that it is not a sin. We're talking about just the, the uh, slavery within itself. Defending the truth about slavery is not the same as defending slavery. What he's saying is that if sin, I can, I can say it better than that, I think. If slavery was a sin, God would call it a sin, condemn it, and have a penalty rather than regulate it. The problem is that man-made philosophies have become the standard of morality rather than the word of God. That's exactly what's happened here. He who 
discards this criterion, meaning the Bible, makes man a reasonless brute and the word an atheistic chaos. That was from Reverend Danby, 1879. The father of President Woodrow Wilson, Reverend Joseph K. Hopkins, and many others recognize that those who denounce slavery as a sin and vilify slaveholders do the opposite, excuse me, do what the apostles never did. Now think about that a moment. They don't, especially Christians, they wouldn't hesitate to vilify slaveholders and denounce slavery and so forth. But they're doing what the apostles never did. Being a legalistic, self-righteous person who takes on superior attitude and emotionally calls something a sin, which the Bible does not, can cause great harm. But the politically correct liberals of today are the modern-day radicals, radical abolitionists of the past, and they did great harm. They were responsible probably more than anybody else if they hadn't got in there and stirred up all this strife Probably over time it could have been settled with them in itself, but they couldn't have it. They were, uh, they they said that slavery is a ghastly horror, and they, you you know who what who what they did, and that's what the politically correct liberals are today. The ones who are hurt most are the ones that they claim to help. The supposed legacy of slavery is presented as a legitimate reason to receive preferential treatment are to receive something for nothing. Do you understand what he's saying there? It has been a horrible scourge. Not because people go around beating their slaves. And we're, we're talking, of course, now about people who are uh, ha have see themselves as a victim. And the government, the politicians respond, as they always do, in the wrong way, and throw money at them, making them think that they are victims, and they are due, they are owed something that no other race, no other people are owed. There's, that's a huge detriment to them and to the country itself. So the supposed legacy of slavery is presented as a legitimate reason to receive preferential treatment or to receive something for nothing. This is a lie resulting in enmity between the races and leaving the... Uh, leaving those who believe it in perpetual poverty. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes. I'm changing gears. Are y'all ready to change gears with me? Okay. Any Baptists in here? You might want to leave. To their shame, 150th Assembly of the Southern Baptist Convention in 1995 passed the infamous rascal, excuse me, racial, reconcil <laughs> rascal, <laughs> racial reconciliation re resolution which defamed and slandered the good name of Southern Baptists for the last 50 years. Excuse me, 150 years. Uh, the Duke delegates regurgitated on cue the liberal politically correct propaganda about the institution of African servitude and life in the Old South. Now, this, that wasn't that long ago. Here are the errors. Number one, this is what the convention said. Our relationship to African Americans has been hindered from the beginning by the role that slavery played in the formation of the Southern Baptist Convention. Sound like something that would be said today, doesn't it? Truth number one, from the very beginning, Baptist churches in the South, both black and white Christians, have worked and worshipped together much closer than anywhere else in the world. According to historian Francis Butler Simkins, Skim, uh, Simkins, true Christian love was displayed more often during the times of slavery than in modern times of freedom. That's a powerful statement there. Error number two, the resolution charged that Southern slavery was particularly inhumane. The truth. Dr. Robert W. Fogel's work on slavery in the Old South was so complete and impressive that it won him the Nobel Peace Prize of 1994. In his book, Time on the Cross, he demonstrated that nowhere in Western Hemisphere were slaves better treated and cared for than in the South. 
What is more shocking is that he showed that the slaves of the South were treated better than were free blacks in the North. Error number three. Racism has led to discrimination, oppressive, uh, oppression, injustice, and violence. Truth number three. Of course, the above statement is true, but not in the context it was presented, which leveled racism only on those of fair complexion. The Southern Baptist admission to the guilt of racism and slavery did not promote goodwill. However, it did promote the demand for more minor minority set-asides, affirmative action, and reparations by the likes of Reverend Jesse Jackson Al Sharpton and, and Reverend Louis Farrakhan. This is what always happens. Every time you take a vacation from the truth and you, you go by your emotions and you follow the crowd, it, even if they have good intention, it always winds up being evil and hurting everyone involved. The only result of kowtowing to black militants and other liberals is further decline of any positive relationship between the two cultures. Boy, do we ever need to remember that today. Error number four. This is a biblical error. According to the resolution, slavery denies the existence of the absolute equality of humankind, and therefore slavery must be a sin. You'll hit, this is another argument. We're all equal. And so slavery is a sin. According to this logic, it follows that no one should complain when he or she is ordered by the government to pay his fair share for the horrors of that most sinful institution. There is a congresswoman, uh, something, uh, Alita Shabib, I, don't, I can't pronounce her name. I have an article that I was going to give you parts of it next time, where she got on the, she's, by the way, one of the, one of the squad members, if you know who they are. And she got on the, on the Congress floor and was pointing her finger at everyone and said, you should be ashamed for oppressing us all these years, and I demand that you pay us our fair share. She said that in the Congress. She probably has millions of dollars she is in the Congress, and yet we're all racist and allow her to make statements like that? Anyway, that's what came to my mind. According to the resolution, slavery de denies the existence of absolute equality of humankind, and therefore slavery must be a sin. According to this logic, it follows that one should complain when he or she is ordered by the government to pay his fair share for horrors of that most sinful of institutions. So in, essentially what he's saying is, what is going to be your attitude when the government commands you, requires you under penalty of fine or imprisonment to pay your fair share of reparations to a particular race? Uh, truth number four. Only God in his word defines what is a sin and what is not. How about that for a starter? If slavery is such a diabolical sin, it should be easy to find a clear-cut, thus saith the Lord, repudiation of it in the Bible. No one in the Southern Baptist Convention or anywhere else is able to do that because there is none. And I have the caveat there of there it's sinful to kidnap someone and sell them. That, that's the only one. If, but that's just one part of slavery. No one in the Southern Baptist Convention or anywhere else can do that because there is none. What is easy to find in the Bible are numerous laws pertaining to the treatment of slaves for their protection. Rules of conduct for both master and slaves abound in scriptures as well as the Tenth Commandment where slaves are listed along with other property. Did you ever realize that? Here's the Tenth, uh, tenth Commandment in Exodus chapter 20 verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male slave. It says servant. The word there is idum, which means 
Slave. It can mean slave or servant, but they didn't call them servants. They were slaves. You are not to covet your his male servant or his female servant. In the tenth commandment. And it goes on. Uh, his male servant, which was a female slave, or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Well, um, there's much... Much more I could give you, but I think that will do. <laughs> By the way, apart from those things that I put asterisks on that we went over tonight, are on the, or I should say, are in the notes on our website, homepage, right hand side, under, uh, what is it, past series, I believe is what it's called. So you can go in there, and, and that was just, there's three major parts in uh, deception or doctrine. That's the one that dealt with slavery. And there's two other parts, but I, I, I hope that you have a better understanding now of the insanity and the abysmal ignorance that's displayed every day when people are talking about these subjects. I dare say that if you have any friends and you ask them what the Bible says about slavery without hesitating. Oh, well, yeah, it calls it a sin. When you talk about slavery, be cautious and be distinct. No one in their right mind would support slavery or be for slavery. But no one in their right mind should relegate it to emotions and ignorance and cause even more harm, which is what is being done now. We want to just speak the truth. If, if, if slavery is so horrible in God's eyes, why are we his slaves? Paul proudly proclaimed that he is a servant, a slave of the Lord. And I declare to you there's not a better place to be. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help us sort these things out in our soul. We went over a lot of material, a lot of things. The main thing is that we have the right perspective and we don't fall for all of the insanity that is going on in our country today. We pray for these people. But if we are engaged by this subject or any subject, we want to be calm, deliberate, and give your view, which is the only real view, of the things that are being talked about. We go to the Bible, always. That is where the truth is. That's where we seek answers. And we see that regarding slavery, there's a lot of regulations to protect slaves. There's a lot of regulations regarding marriage and divorce. In, in divorce, there's certain things that people can do and what they cannot do. That's where we go for guidance, but it seems like people are abysmally ignorant of what the Bible says and not even interested. But if we find every once in a while someone that really wants to know the truth, we pray that you will help us in a loving and thoughtful way, and yet in a dogmatic way, let them know what your word says about the issue. We shouldn't be afraid of this. We should be looking forward to this. This is how we can help. This is one way we can save our nation, even though we know it's in your hands. So we pray that you will help us to meditate on this, if necessary, talk to each other, and form a good conclusion about these things so that we can give it to others and be good and faithful servants. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.